on to high school age. This gets really hard. Uh, at our house, when, uh, when our oldest kids, uh, or actually probably by the time that um, the youngest kid hit high school age, our family meals disappeared, and they, they've never come back. I'm, I'm not necessarily really proud of saying that. Uh, would you, is that your experience too? We just don't eat together anymore, because in our house, we're like a railroad station now. We don't have group life anymore. Uh, we, they may, we even have four services at our church, and so my kids, who are maybe trying to carve out a different identity, my 20-year-olds and 24-year-olds, will go to different services just to show it because they can. So we don't even all go to church together at the same time anymore. So everything in our house starting, and it started in the teen years where everybody's going backwards and forwards on a different timetable means family meals stop. That's a big loss, and you've got to find other ways to compensate for what you're losing. Think of what good stuff happens at family meals. Like what? You pray together. Yeah, absolutely. We, we, we would go around the table, and everybody had to think of somebody to pray for. And we'd wait. You know, one of the ways to make that happen is, um, you know, I'd say, all right, Liz, your turn. And she says, I can't think of anybody. And so, the, right, the correct answer of dad at that moment is, we'll wait. So then they learned that scam doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> what else? What else is good about family meals? Oh man, communication. Do you play, ever play high-low around your, around your table? What, what few times you get them together? What's the coolest thing that happened today? What's the worst thing that happened today? And each kid has to say a high and a low as you go around the table. You find out what's going on. You can, and sometimes as parents, it's good to pretend that you're deaf and dumb and just shut up and listen to the chatter. And the kids think, oh, the old people are senile, they can't hear us. And they start to talk with each other and you, you learn so much stuff if you just sometimes just clam up and like hover in the background or start clearing dishes or something, just listen to the kids talking. That was our family devotion time when everybody was in the same room at the same time. We have never gotten back to that wonderful intimacy because mealtime made that possible. And the high school years is when it just flies away and, and uh, we've never been able to get that back because uh, people are not awake and in the building at the same time anymore. The, middle, the uh, high school age also is where the kids really begin their separation in earnest. And my kids all, one, one after the other, detached from me um, emotionally in those years. And I, it, it was a heavy blow for me to take. I just wondered, w what had I done to become such a loser in their eyes where they wanted nothing to do with me? And then I had a flashback to my own high school freshman year where uh, I wanted to go to a basketball game, which usually meant that I had to take three buses to get to Wisconsin Lutheran High School from where we lived. And I would get back really late. And my father actually said, you know what? I don't have any meetings tonight. I'll take you. And so he and my mother and I went to this high school basketball game. And as soon as we got within 30 yards of the front door of the school, guess what I did? You know, you, you've been there before. Guess what, what did I do? I ditched them. I'm not with them. And I'm ashamed of it to this very day. And that shame actually tempers my feelings of hurt and resentment when my children like don't want to stand by me or they don't ask me anything anymore. Don't you realize I could help explain the mysteries of your world? They're not interested in my explanations anymore. And that really hurts. Like, have, have I gotten that stupid? Has, have my years of toiling on this planet, is that not a resource for you anymore? Like, like what? Like all, all of my learnings were in vain for you? Can't you learn anything from me? They are going through that because they have to stand on their own. It's, it's part of the detaching and forming their own personality, and it comes at a cost. And we got to not panic and, and uh, get all hyper about that. Because uh, I've now lived long enough, and my kids have lived long enough, that when they come out of that, they are really cool people. And for one thing, Starting in middle school, they don't like themselves very much. Do you know how much self-hatred goes on in the world? We look around at each other, you know, I look at you guys, and you all look comfortably, comfortably dressed, you're all able to punch out of your lives and hang out with us on a Saturday morning. You're church guys, most of you are leaders in your congregations, you're, you know, you're, you're all successful, you've done well in the business world, you've got good jobs, you've got families. 
you got a million friends, look at this army of men, we're hanging out together and you're gonna, you came with a bunch of friends and you're gonna leave with more and we've got these great relationships, we've got this great network going on, but yet ha half the guys in that room may be a much higher percentage, but I'll, I would bet large segments of my pension that half the guys in the room uh, an hour and a half ago don't like themselves very much. They're painfully aware of their shortcomings. They know that some of what they're presenting to the world is a fraud and they're making it up. They're afraid that um, their past screw-ups are going to come back and haunt them. And, and they, they are painfully aware of the man I wish I were and here's who I really am. And your kids can't, and we've got defenses for that. Those of us who are a little older, you got a little gray on the dome. We, we work out ways to deal with that self-hatred. We distract ourselves or pretend, or we buff one little piece of our biography to brag on. But um, high school kids have nowhere to, they, they don't have enough practice at that yet. So most high school kids don't like themselves. Their kids, the one of the reasons that high school kids rip on each other all the time and are so cruel and brutal is they don't like themselves. Mean people and bullies do not bully out of a sense of feeling strong. They bully because they feel weak. And so we got to be there for kids. My, my uh, high schoolers used to yell at me that I don't listen to them, which I thought was absurd. And so there's only one response at a time like that. Just say, got time for you now, dude. What's on your mind? And be quiet. Don't tell them they're idiots. Of course I listen to you. That's, that's just, they're, they're groping for language why they don't feel good right now or why they don't like what they're doing at this particular moment. Don't panic over that. Go ahead, question in the back. It's back in the, the, like the 11, 14 years, if you recall, that's the time when we had, we could do things together because they weren't so busy in high school, like we happened to like to hunt the fish or whatever. And, and we did that during that time frame. Then when they got into high school, well, I ended up selling the boat because the only time I moved was when I slept around it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, then you just go with the kids all the time, but you still kind of have a base maybe. If you do something with them in that 11 to 20 half time, or when they have time, it seemed, for us anyway, it came back again later on, you know, they just kind of showed up again, you know, like you yeah. said. So it was kind of, you know, then, then it, really, it really was kind of a bridge over the high school years, although yeah. you, you seem like you're running all the time in high school, but yeah. it seemed what, to come back. Though. What a great, great comment. In fact, two very powerful ideas in what you just said. One is that um, along with family meals, um, disintegrating when kids get in high school and they're either in sports or their high school lives get crazy uh, or you, you're on different timetables some people have to get up at 530 and other people um, maybe get up later uh, family vacations go down the drain too don't they when when your kids are eight you just say get in the van off we go when when they're 50 when they're 16 they're working they want they need money and they're working they can't go with you anymore and so you lose that family feel of where you all go away somewhere. But your second powerful idea is you involving yourself in their lives. And uh, man, there's a lot of, a lot, a lot of shiny pants on, on dads who sat in a lot of bleachers and warmed their butts watching their kids do stuff. Uh, for me, the crappiest job as a, as a dad is being a dad of a, of a track runner. <laughs> I see we've got some track we got some track guys or some track girls here. Oh, is that painful. You wait, it's always in spring. You know, here in the land of cheese, the track season starts, it's raw, it's rainy, it's windy. You stand out there, wait, and uh, you know, okay dad, the meet starts at three, so all right, I'm gonna punch out this I'm gonna leave work early, I'm gonna go there. It's three o'clock. Uh you go find one of those little mimeo sheets they hand out and your kids in, in the 400 meters, which is gonna be held at quarter to five. <laughs> and so you stand there picking your nose, trying to, trying to find something to do, trying to strike up conversations with strangers, warming yourself somewhere, waiting, waiting, waiting. The kid does this thing, and it's over. And then you say, good, get in the van. No, can't do it, Dad, we all gotta stay 
till the last thing because they want the team cheering for the last guy too. So you get to stay another hour and watch strangers. <laughs> oh, that's tough. But the fact is, <laughs> totally worth it. Why? You're there with them and you are giving a piece of yourself to them. Your kids, maybe you think all they want is my money or all they want is for me to croak and give them an inheritance. The prodigal son has always been like that. Can't wait for dad to die to get dad's stuff. What your kids want and need from you, though they often can't articulate it, is they want you. Not your stuff. They just want you. And when they want you to stay with them, you know, teachers figure out, if you're going to survive in the teaching biz, you figure out that some kids misbehave not because they take delight in doing evil, although there certainly is some of that. Some kids misbehave, why? To get attention. They just want somebody to notice them and interact and show that you're going to be involved in their life to straighten them out. And they will misbehave just to get the teacher paying attention to me. And if they figured out I'm no genius, I'm not going to be able to get attention by my great grades, so then I have to get it another way. And man, all you guys whose um, oldest kid is in zone D, just be strong right now and hang on because it's going to get better. And I had the ecstatic uh, joy of seeing my, um, uh, my kid who was 21 years old after he came, I call it coming out of the pipe. You know, you, they go into a culvert somewhere uh, when, when they're at, not always at the same age, like maybe about age 14 or so. They go into a culvert and, and you don't know what's going to happen to them. They think you're an idiot. You think, what have the wheels come off with you? Why are you so moody all the time? Why are you so secretive? You don't tell me anything. How was your day? You know, you, uh, you go and pick them up from school. How's your day? Right. Tell me something. I don't know. They don't even talk. You have to pry information out of them with a can opener. Like, where, where we used to, hey, you're my buddy. Like, we used to, like, talk. And, where do they go? Well, they come out of the tunnel, and are they ever fun when they come out of the tunnel? That's all I'm saying. It's worth the wait. Hang on.